move on to start our Sunday school that we like to sing a hymn this morning that's appropriate for our discussion about peace. Number 431, hymn number 431, Let There Be Peace on Earth. We'll just sing it all the way through. 431. Of, 
uh, is the Beatitudes. We we see the, the opening, one of the opening verses of our focal passages is from that fifth chapter of, of Matthew, uh, the ninth verse, which again, that's what, it, what we often refer to as the Beatitudes and these words from these words that Christ spoke uh, from the Sermon on the Mount or whatever you care to call it. The ninth verse says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called sons of God. It's the fruit of peace that's a value to God. It's not necessarily that there will be peace. It's not necessarily that peace will exist again. Don't forget the message that you just heard Bill share with us. We know that peace will not always exist. But it is the fruit of peace. It is the limiting of conflict that will allow his message to go through. Will allow his message to be heard for one thing. Because if there is objection, if there is conflict about delivering his message, then there is going to be challenges to delivering his message. There are going to be challenges to getting his message out. So therefore, it's going to make it more difficult. It's going to make it more challenging to do that. And you know, there's, there's so many places that we see different thoughts on how all of this is impacted. We look at the book of James. There's a passage in the book of James that I want to be sure to share with you this morning. Um, he makes the comment, this is James writing in, it's the third chapter in the 18th verse of the book of James. It says, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. In other words, if we go about bringing the peace of Jesus Christ to the world around us, there will be a harvest of righteousness because people will come to know the Lord they will come to follow the Lord. And if they come to follow the Lord, then there will be righteousness in the world. Peace brings righteousness. Righteousness brings peace. It's all interlinked. It will work together. It will be successful. It will take place. Our attention can't focus on our relationship with God when there is conflict around us. If we are in conflict, we are distracted from our relationship with God. And that's where the peace becomes a value, is that we are not distracted from our relationship with Him. Romans, the book of Romans, 12th, uh, the 12th verse and the 18th of uh, 12th chapter and the 18th no. verse Thank you. of Romans. He says, I'm not sure I've got the right thing, Romans 12, 18. Sorry. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What verse is that? Romans 12, 18. As far as it's possible, if it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Anything has to start with us. We can't control the world around us. 
We can only control what we do. We can only control our own actions. What we hope is that if we are reflecting Him, that our actions will reflect well on Him and the world will be led to Him. That's what we're charged with doing. We're charged with reflecting Him. If we are peaceful, loving, caring individuals, then we are reflecting Him. And if we're reflecting Him, that will bring about a better world. That will bring about a more pleasant world. But the pleasant part of it is not the most important thing. The pleasant part of it serves as an environment for his work to take place, for him to act in the hearts of individuals and make his mark in their lives. Questions, comments at this point? I'd like to thank all the people that make it possible to transport me and others to the worship service, and uh, that's a real blessing for me. To be peaceful gives room for, for God to, to, to enter, and it's easy for me to lose my temper sometimes, and I think the world oftentimes can lose its temper and, and fill the, the space with confusion and chaos and make it real difficult for the message of God to come through. And I know for me, it's much too easy for me to get off on an anger line and to completely cut off the peace line for, for God to say something. And I know that's something that I personally have to work on to keep peace in myself so that God can have room to express himself. The most important thing Jesus tells us is to love him with all our hearts, minds, and spirit and then to love our neighbors as ourselves he tells us that. he tells us that is the most important thing as long as there is strife as long as there is violence as long as there is something distracting from that then it can't take place as long as our attention you know, the media is, is always feeding us contention, strife. Occasionally we get a little bit of good news, but 90% of what we receive is bad news. 90% of it is to create turmoil in our lives. And as long as that turmoil exists, then we can't focus on the Lord. And that was my point of a minute ago, is that it's the fruit of the peace that is of value. It's not the peace itself, it's the fruit of the peace. It's the fruit of the peace, meaning the environment that we can share the message of the Lord, about the Lord, in a good way. That's what the environment allows us to do. The environment doesn't share it, but it allows it to be shared in the right way. If I am a child of God, then I probably will display some of the characteristics of God's nature. <coughs> and sometimes that can enable me to see who I am and correct myself because I know 
a child of God doesn't behave just any kind of way. And so if I notice myself not behaving like a child of God, maybe that will help me to get myself back on track as a child of God and, and, and make peace to allow for the interest of, of God in, in the situation. We always have to look in that mirror first. We do. We truly do. Because that's, uh, yep, that's right. We have to slap ourselves on the hand. And hopefully we slap ourselves on the hand before he does. The next part of our scriptural passages is some verses that are much used and often maligned and taken out of context. Again, we're still in we're still in Matthew. We're still in the fifth chapter of Matthew. But we're going to look at verses 38 through 42. You have heard it said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. You're, you'll talk about that this morning. Mm -hmm. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. These verses come from the book of Exodus. And it's interesting when you go back and you read it in the book of Exodus and you read it in the context that it is given. It's very significant. It kind of points us to a lot of the things that are generally true about Scripture in that you need to take it in context. You need to take it in its complete form. That those verses first appear, those that admonition, if you will, first occurs in the 21st chapter of Exodus, and it occurs in the 20, it actually occurs in the 26th verse. Now let me, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, 22nd verse. I'm going to read the whole, I'm going to read the 22nd through the 24th verse. Because the 24th verse is what we just heard, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand. But the 22nd verse says, if two men are fighting in a pregnant woman, and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands in the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Again, we hear these verses, we hear that verse, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, we hear that verse used very often. And again, as you just heard, it can be taken out of context. The Lord was giving specific instructions for a specific incident. That's what he said. That's what he said should be done in the event of this specific incident. Now, there are other places, if you go to the book of Deuteronomy, if you go to the book of Leviticus, it also shares that same context. It shares that same thought. But it shares it in the context not only of general retaliation, but it also shares it in the context of equal retaliation. In other words, one of the points 
that the Lord is trying to make is that the response the punishment should fit the crime. If you if your neighbor steals his steals your pig, it doesn't give you the right to burn his house down. There is retribution, fairness in retribution. There is fairness in the punishment that's meted out. This whole thing, like I, like I started out saying, this whole thing about violence, this whole thing about peace, the whole concept of how we interact with each other can become very emotional, it can become very controversial, it, be, it can become very difficult to embrace, very difficult to know. And we're not necessarily going to figure it out on our own. You know, the verses that say, you know, if he, if he strikes you on the cheek, turn the other. If he takes your tunic, give him your coat. How far do you go with that? Is there an end to that? Do you never cease to react to injustice? Do you never seek to respond to that? If you look at the different caveats, if you look at the different responses that he tells us about, it simply means, not simple, it's not simple. Because the simplicity comes in the fact that we have to have our relationship on a sound footing with the Lord. We have to have our relationship rooted with him, that our peace will be placed in him. Our peace will come from the strength of our relationship with him and not from our relationship with the world. You know, the world is always going to be in conflict. The world is always going to be in conflict with itself. The world is going to be in conflict with the church. The message today was that there will be division. There will be personal division. There will be personal division because of Jesus Christ. That will exist. But as long as we have the Holy Spirit, we will have the peace in our hearts. We will have that peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace that is known only through a relationship with him. And hopefully, despite our human tendencies, despite our human nature, despite our tendency to someone hits me, I want to hit them back, that we can respond in love. It doesn't always mean we can agree. It doesn't mean that we will always be able to accept what they have done. But we must respond in love. We must respond in caring and compassion. I don't know. It gets, com it gets complicated. And there are no simple answers. Comments? Thoughts? Jesse? Well, yeah. I think love oftentimes has forgiveness, and we don't always have to respond with an equal action or uh, with justice. Sometimes, instead of giving somebody justice, we can forgive them and go on.
because they associate it with personal retaliation when it's primarily dealing with the civil cases. It's to ensure that there's a punishment that's brought you know, to those uh, who, who retaliate in the wrong way. And, you know, he's not altering the meaning of the law. He's actually affirming it. He's confirming, you know, the true sense of the meaning of the law. And so, uh, but uh, the basic principle is just limiting that retribution uh, to that which was just, you know. And uh, many times we can just accept that as a personal retaliation uh, meaning. And therefore, we just try to say, well, an eye for an eye, two for a two. But that's certainly not what Jesus was, was meaning. You know, we're not supposed to, as humans, it is not our tendency, and it's not the way we are, quote, unquote, supposed to respond. We're supposed to retaliate. You know, we talked about it last week. David sent an emissary to the king of the, well, whatever, one of those groups. He sent an emissary when the king died, he sent emissaries to that kingdom to express sympathies from Israel. Well, they took it as though he was sending spies. That he was sending people there to see what they had going on and report back to David So they made they humiliated them and sent them back to David. Well, David in turn went to war with them and he defeated them. So we know God was with David in so much of what he did. We know that he was with him in battle. We know that he killed Goliath, helped him heal. He was the one who killed Goliath through David. But yet, David, in all of his humanness, still did things that would not follow Jesus' law. Didn't even follow God's law at that time. Lots of mixed emotions. Lots of challenges take place. And one of the things that we need to keep in mind And I know I'm bouncing around. And I know I'm going kind of from one point to the other to bring together a, a group of points that keep us focused on the Lord. But challenges and conflicts always exist. They exist within the church. They exist within our families. They exist within the world. All of those things take place. And we have a responsibility as well as a right to challenge thoughts and decisions and to be a part of division. We have, just because we're divided on something doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing. Again, sermon this morning. But it's how we do it. You know, I have the right to attack an idea, a policy, an issue, but I have no right to attack the person. I have no right to verbally go against that person because that person is a child of God. Child of the Almighty God. Just like I am. They are, they are imperfect just like I am. I am imperfect just like they are. So 
any response that I make should be predicated on Christ's love for me and how I respond in his love how I respond to the issue should be founded in his love. The way I respond should be founded in his love. Again, doesn't mean that you can't disagree, that I can't disagree, but as we do it, we do it in that atmosphere, in that environment of peace, in that environment of love. And again, if it's in the environment of love, there won't be an environment of peace. If there's an environment of peace, there will be an environment of love. Comments? Discussions? The world oftentimes wants to get even. But we can sometimes turn that situation around with peace. And, and where they get even with with peace. <coughs> accelerate and escalate and increase the, the tension, sometimes we can turn it around by instead of having an equal getting get even the spirit, the peace sometimes can, can turn it around and, and make the other individual look at it differently instead of one to, to accelerate and to build it up. Uh, so, sometimes the peace will, will cause them to pause, will, will cause them to take a second look at things. Not only does the world want to retaliate, I want to retaliate. Somebody cuts me off, I want to run over them. You know, I mean, that's what I want to do. I mean, it's as simple as that. I was with somebody last week and I think the person in front of them hit the brakes uh, because they, they would have almost missed the turn and they wanted to make a turn. And this person felt that they could have caused them to wreck that car and they just screamed out uh, ugly sound, you know. They didn't say bless you, my child. They didn't right? say bless you. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, by by this person getting excited and getting angry, they could have made a, a, another problem. They could have got us killed. You know, getting angry and losing their attention on the other car. Uh, they could have caused a, another negative situation. Whereas if they had been able to hold their peace and allow the person in front of them to make that turn, and go on, the traffic would have been a lot safer. But by them getting excited and getting angry, they really could have made the situation much worse. And the peace in that situation, and the peace in situations similar to that, worse than that, more minor than that, will only come from within and our relationship with the Holy Spirit. That's the only way we can respond to that in peace. That's the only way that we can respond to it in love. That's the only way that we can do it is instead of running over them, I got to reach up and grab his hand. That's the only way we can do it. Sometimes you can diffuse a situation with negotiation. I ran into that one time when I was used to walk down to the Cavalier. I was going down Bedford Avenue and I was on that bridge that overlooks the railroad and two guys banged into me and we were going to start a fight. So I backed up against the bridge and I said, hey fellas, we have a dilemma here. I said, uh, I see I see that y'all have some hostility going, but I said, we have another decision to make before y'all jump. It was that man. I said, y'all need to decide which one of y'all are going to land on those railroad tracks over there. Oh, that was crazy. <laughs> and they left. But I was sitting there scared to death, but I figured I would try negotiation before I got into a fight. Well, and it goes back to the point that, again, we can disagree on things. 
but we have to approach it in a way that exhibits I mean you care about somebody you don't want to fight you don't want a conflict again we need to exhibit him in what we do so our closing prayer says Lord thank you for your love that sees the best in us help us to hear your call to be peacemakers and not peace breakers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for the good discussion, as always.